Hey, FFR listeners. If you love getting to listen in on our convos each week, consider helping us keep bringing our signature brand of feminist pop culture analysis to you by joining our Patreon community at patreon.com slash femfreak. You can get early access, exclusive bonus episodes, participate in AMAs, join our friendly Discord server, and more. That's patreon.com slash femfreak. See you there. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Feminist Frequency Radio. This episode is going to be a bit different from our typical format today because Carolyn and I are going to have a focused conversation about some important recent events that have been happening in the games industry. What's up, Carolyn? Hello. Uh, Before we get started, I just want to, from the top, say a blanket trigger warning for discussions of abuse and suicide um, because we are going to talk about the sort of Me Too movement that hit the games industry over the last couple of weeks. So just to start us off, um, on August 26th, a veteran game developer published a lengthy and detailed blog post entitled Calling Out My Rapist, in which she recounted her history with video game composer Jeremy Soule, a history of psychological abuse, sexual abuse, and rape. The post also detailed how Soule used his influence in professional spaces to protect himself from any repercussions of his actions and to have her removed from projects that she was working on. Her brave statements resulted in a flood of blog posts, Twitter threads, and other public declarations from people detailing abuse from numerous men in various facets of the game industry, resulting in what some have called, including us, gaming's Me Too moment. So it's been a pretty intense couple of weeks for many of us, and uh, the podcasts that we have released since then were recorded before all of this happened, Yeah, and Carolyn and I just felt like it might be useful to... I don't know, talk about a little bit what's going on from our perspective as people who have been (laughs) in and around the games industry, um, who have been targets of a lot of toxicity from the games industry and what this means for us. So, Carolyn, how are you you feeling? Gosh, it's always just emotionally difficult uh, to be witness to to moments like this because it's, it's those times in which the reality of patriarchy and rape culture that we just live in constantly and that that we as women certainly uh, and as feminists are, are constantly aware of but you know it just becomes it's so in your face and so and just the the, the trauma it it causes and the way that those that each act of abuse and trauma is is not even just an isolated incident but a ripple that causes harm you know in in, a, in its wake like in a in this kind of rippling effect. I mean, you just can't escape it and it's, it's exhausting, but I guess I want to start uh, by just saying like, and this kind of goes without saying, but I also feel like it's an important just point to make and a connection to be made is that you cannot of course separate what's happened in in games from our larger, deeply patriarchal rape culture. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about how in particular there is this attitude um, in so many facets of our culture, that talented men, gifted men, men who you know may who are in, viewed in some way as exceptional, like their gifts or their whatever they can achieve with those gifts, is sort of seen as um, as sacred. And so, I'm thinking, for instance, of you know Brock Turner or the Steubenville rape case. Uh, these sorts of events where. Um, there's so much concern in the media about, oh, the future of these athletes, what they might accomplish and, and like in their, an erasure of, but what about what the women who they have, who the survivors in these incidents, what about what they lose, what they may not be able to accomplish, provide, create in this world because of what has happened to them. And, you know, I mean, we're recording this a few days after um, the New York Times published, you know, a n- new like bombshell information about Brett Kavanaugh's uh, youth, his history at Yale. But it was couched in this article that it, the headline wasn't anything like, you know, new information about Kavanaugh's history of of you know rape and abuse. It, it was it was it was just you know, oh, the culture at Yale, like, you know, this, this young woman didn't fit in and Brett Kavanaugh did fit in. Like, that's how it was framed. And, you know, so Jeremy Soule, for instance, and just as just one of the people that is kind of, um, has been named, um, in, in these recent weeks, is definitely that type of figure where his music 
is, you know, is sort of viewed as like, um, it, you know, it's uh, it, for people who maybe aren't in, in those circles and aren't familiar, like Jeremy Soule's sort of score for the game Morrowind, for instance, you know, it almost in video games has the same kind of cultural cachet as like John Williams' score for Star Wars. It is considered this like legendary, like pinnacle of, you know, of of music in, in video games. And, and, and be, you know, and so because there's all this hand wringing about like, I think, Oh, what what he can accomplish, what great men can accomplish. And again, so little concern uh, or so little heed paid to like, what about all the women constantly throughout history in so many ways or in other marginalized people who don't get to create the amazing things they have inside of them because of men like Jeremy Soule? Yeah, and I think that that is something that has come up a lot with. So when we say you know, I I think most of our listeners are familiar, but Me Too, uh, when we refer to that now, we're referring to allegations of um, abuse, various kinds of abuse, predatory behavior. Um, Generally, it started with um, people coming out in Hollywood against really, you know, powerful men, um, namely Weinstein and others. And I think that, um, I think that this is like, it's such an interesting moment because, it's not like men and powerful men haven't been called out historically for predatory behavior or, or abuse, right? Like we, it is called co- like mainstream cultural knowledge of Roman Polanski is an abuser and pedophile. Yes. No, Woody well, Allen is a pedophile. I don't know. No, no, There's a well, lot of, hmm. they're, they're terrible. We have all of these stories of these men who are terrible and just like get away with it and get to keep creating and get to, you know, yes. like Woody Allen in particular is is a really troubling example because he's still making movies that are being highly acclaimed, right? Um, Quentin Tarantino is another example that came out more recently. You know, his movie just came out and people are like, woo! You know, like he still gets so much hype and funding and all of that kind of stuff. And so now I think we're in a moment where, you know, it is there is a lot more mainstream awareness of how prevalent abuse is, especially like male abuse towards others. Um, and th- what I think the Me Too movement is doing is it's forcing us to reckon with it as a society. Now, whether we're doing that well, whether we're actually taking all of the necessary steps to really protect those who have been harmed and support those who have been harmed is a totally different conversation. Mm-hmm. But I think there is more of a mainstream understanding that like this is way more common than the average person um, suspects it is. Yeah. Um, or, and, and I would say also not even just the average person, but like men, like women, right. and this is not this is not exclusive at all to women, as um, you know, like non-binary folks and men are also abused. But the vast majority of abuse is men abusing women, right? Yeah, and I mean, part um, of, and girls. Oh yeah, and part I mean because part of what patriarchal systems do in a way is work to to work they work to kind of make themselves invisible, such that you know you have a lot of men who. Uh, I think earnestly ask the question of like, in in so many of these cases of like, well, why didn't she just say something? Or, you know, why didn't, she, why wasn't it just report? And so one of the great things about, or one of the powerful and effective things about the initial blog post that sort of set off these, this whole domino effect of revelations that we're talking about right now is that it detailed the ways in which, uh, Jeremy Soule also worked to kind of use his power and influence in those circles to, you know, protect himself and to lock out, uh, you know, um, yeah. so, lock her out of 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 uh, work. You know, I, I mean, these. So w- yes. one of the things that we're seeing. Well, sorry, hold on. One yeah. thing that I was going to say before is that the the statistically, like, I think it's one in four women have been abused, um, and so like. That the reason I brought that up around gender and who is causing harm to who is that like women know this is happening, right? Um, and it's just it's it's men who are like what no, and like other women who are protecting men, right? In, in this space, so that was the point I was trying to make there. But but coming back to what you're saying is that like so one of the things that um we did uh, at Feminist Frequency is we opened up a makeshift hotline because we immediately were like, well, how can we help and 
through that and through reading the stories of other people who've come forward and all the whisper networks, like what you're saying, Carolyn, is that like men are, are man- deeply like these men who are perpetrators and serial perpetrators are so deeply manipulative that they create scenarios that not only like are actually harming women physically or emotionally, but doing damage to them as a part of the games industry and in the community. So a number of people that I spoke to over the last several weeks were so afraid and are still to come forward because these men have created situations in which um, they have been talking to other people in the community to so dissent in preparation for ever being called out in their of their abusive and predatory behavior. And that is like talk about psychological abuse and gaslighting. Yeah, absolutely. And and those are just, you know, the systems in place that work to protect um abusive men. I mean, our our whole culture in so many ways is bent toward toward protecting those men. Again, you know, again, to go back to what I was saying earlier about how often when there are high profile cases, rape cases in the media, the concern, the hand wringing is about what the, the man, you know, who perpetrated the abuse is going to lose. What about, you know, what he has, uh, what he won't be able to accomplish and the, the women, you know, or the, the survivors in these case of, of any gender, like are kind of, you know, their lives, their, the, the, the are erased. Right. I mean, it's, um, and and the thing is that like, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, the thing is too, and just like, so I have a, what Carolyn, you proposed that we talked about this and I was like, yes, we absolutely should. But I, I really struggle with like this conversation publicly, like how to, how to have this with you in a, in a forum that many other people will hear because like, I personally have been in the thick of this for the last several weeks in terms of supporting communities and people reaching out and friends and colleagues and then like losing friends that I found out were abusive and like just yeah. the, it's so deeply personal without, you know, without uh, me personally coming forward about any kind of harm. And I think that what I realized in not realize, but one of the things that I would like to make clear here is that like, the amount of harm that is so long lasting. Some of these stories are from like a decade ago and these women are so the, the women and non-binary folks that I've spoken to are so deeply broken and like just the psychological trauma of what went, what happened, how they've like left the industry or didn't pursue careers in the industry because they're so afraid of, of the repercussions or ramifications of interacting with the people who had abused them or of um, not being believed if they came forward or, or being worried about the rumors that the perpetrators have spread. And like, it was just deflating to hear ultimately the same stories over and over and over again and the same reactions to those stories and the same pain. Like this isn't someone today was like, I was talking to someone today and they were like, well, um, our, you know, studio head or whatever was thinking about making a public statement, but then was like, well, it died down already. And I'm like, this is not like, just as in this has been existing for years and years and years, like, Abuse has existed long before the games industry <laughs> existed, right? It's just a part of the larger culture that you were talking about, Carolyn, with like rape culture and, and all of that. Um, but that like we have this impression that if it's not immediately in our faces, co- like day in and day out, that it doesn't exist anymore. And that's not true at all. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, as you say, right, it, it, the, we hear these stories, you know, patterns of abuse just replicated again and again and again, which is a testament to the fact that this is not about, I mean, uh, uh, individual abusers. I mean, of course, it, like individual abusers absolutely must be like removed, you know, isolated, just dealt with, but that's not, you don't fix the issue simply, you know, this isn't an issue of, oh, there's a few bad apples here and there. We just replace them with other people and voila, everything's fine. We, it, this demands a, a really a deep interrogation of, of 
the the culture at you know more deeply and the systems that uh, that allow so many men to think that to 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 get to engage in this behavior and to to get away with it and that is such a you know multifaceted complex process that goes far beyond like the scope of this you know little podcast conversation that you and I <laughs> are going to have right here yeah. but it's but it's it's necessary right i mean and and i mean it it has to do with i mean it with just everything from just men fundamentally seeing women, uh, you know, as people, I mean, like just in terms of how our culture like shapes attitudes around gender to, I mean, to, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I was walking into the grocery store this morning and um, there was a woman in front of me who was wearing tights and the, one of the employees walked out and literally like comically turned his head to stare at her ass when she walked mm -hmm, away. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I see this all the time yeah. and I've, I've yelled at men for doing this. They don't like that. Just oh, FYI, weird that they don't you, like that. When you catch them being <laughs> shitty. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, I think that a lot of men who do that kind of behavior are just like, well, it's harmless. Exactly. It doesn't matter, but I'm like, but it isn't harmless. Like you are commodifying and objectifying and degrading women by being like, I'm going to go out of my way to stare at your body parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like it, it's so it's these little things that I think exist in our culture that create the, the what you're talking about is like women are not seen as human. They're seen as sex objects or, yeah. you, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, I mean, the attitude, you know, again, as far as patriarchy and working to kind of make itself invisible, like there's so much narrative, so much cultural belief around there about that's just the way it is. Like, this is just the way men are. This is just the way women are, which isn't true at all. Like, th these are absolutely, you know, these kinds of behaviors, the, the little, behavior, you know, relatively little behavior of a dude turning to stare at a woman's ass in the supermarket, you know, and on up to the larger uh, much more transgressive, you know, types of things that we're talking about. I mean, are they're absolutely rooted in so many cultural attitudes and ideas about gender and about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman and and so on. And I mean, I, I'm really concerned, actually, you know, to go back to what you said about, you know, somebody saying, well, the moment has already passed. And like, I that I fear that like that scares me, this idea of what happened um, a few weeks ago should be the start of something, something ongoing, something deep and transformative. But I mean, I understand that people, the news cycle is so rapid nowadays, and we want to move on so quickly to the next thing, and our attention spans are so short, and we get bored and, and everything, but we cannot, we we cannot, like, let go of this already. We cannot let this moment be over with without yeah. harnessing that energy and and doing something with it. Totally. And this would be a wonderful segue into what do we do about it, but I'm going to ruin that uh, by bringing up something else. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, so one of the things that's a little bit unprecedented in this particular moment of how like big, the, like I know that this is our space, right? Like the games industry is our particular space. And so it's amplified for us um, in this conversation and and some of the folks in and around this uh, because, you know, we, we know some of these people um, yeah. and we certainly know people who have been affected by others. But I think, um, you know, so one, so I've purposely not been naming a lot of names as we've been talking. I feel right. like I want to be cautious about that. Um, and uh, not that we shouldn't name abusers and we absolutely should. And I have no problem naming those names, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to still navigate and, and figure out that, you know, how to best support people who have been harmed because I don't know what they want. <laughs> like, I don't know if they want to have their stories amplified or their names said over and over again or what have you. That's very an individual choice. Mm -mm. Um, so anyways, all of that is to say that we hit a very unprecedented moment when one person, Alec, um, what's Alec's last name? I can't even Hello, remember. Haloka? Hello, yeah, Haloka, who um, is a game designer, who was a game designer in the industry for a long time, and a composer who had several people um, accuse him of abuse and rape and kidnapping. Um, he killed himself several days later. And the ramifications of that 
um, are deeply complicated. And I think that is something that happened in our space that is a little bit different than the larger Me Too movement where, um, and, and I, it's so hard to talk about because I'm so close to so many people that are close to him mm-hmm. and that were close to him and that were deeply affected on many, many levels, um, whether like friends or people that have been harmed or what have you, and just how uh, devastating that is it for so many reasons, right? Not, not just because like, not just because someone was, they were friends or family and like the, how tragic that is, but that like, I mean, the the complexity of grief around an issue like this is so, is so deep. And I mean, you know, you can, I mean, I'm not saying this specifically about anyone in this particular case, but let's be clear. You can be abused by a person and, and, you know, you hear that they die and it's devastating to you, right? I mean, it's like, for just as an example, like, I mean, it's so, it's so, it's just so complicated, the emotional just realities around things like this. Um, Well, and and the harm that is done through that. So the part of why I brought this up is one, I think that it's it's this sort of unprecedented moment of like, well, what, what happens to our movement now? Right. Like yeah. are are we are, are more people going to be afraid to speak up for fear right. that that this will happen to the person that they uh, have accused. But um I mean of course I, the game industry being what it is and a certain segment of the of gaming uh of gamers being what they are, there was an immediate leap at the at this, uh, this 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 horrifying and opportunistic leap to, you know, blame th- those who who came out with their with their truths, their stories about what Alec had done to them, and like and you know weaponize his 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 suicide and blame them for it, which is just absolutely, I mean, monstrous and horrifying and like beyond the pale. Like, don't you dare like put what he did on the people that he abused. Right, um, and and so we're dealing with another, you know, the. the Part of the complicatedness of a Me Too movement happening in games is that there is such an aggressive, a deeply, deeply, deeply aggressive, um, toxic culture that yes. we exist in, in a way that, yeah, exists in other, like, other types of media, but that is very prevalent in games, and it's hard to... Uh, deal with any of this stuff in any particular way... <laughs> without that being a part of the sort of background noise and the sheer vehemence of and and horrificness of the the abuse coming from quote unquote fans or like that toxic mm-hmm. sort of gamer culture that that spurred up like that stuff is a, another trauma on top of everything else that is happening and remember like it is particularly bad for those who are being targeted, um, the the survivors who have spoken up and are being targeted, but it affects all of us because bystander trauma is real, right? And so we're seeing all of this happening. Other survivors who haven't come out are seeing this happening and like nobody knows what to do because it's so frightening. And I think that we clam up and we close up and we isolate ourselves. And to me, you know, when we talk about like, how do we change things? We yeah. change things by building communities of support. Yes. We, you know, and like, that is what, you know, it's amazing. The pe- There are people I haven't talked to in years that we immediately connected and like were in contact every day, all day long for weeks because you build these communities of support. And I want to make sure that those networks are available much more wide- widely than just, you know, the fact that I know a lot of people in this industry, right? Like it, it can't just be, um, who you know, right? It has to be some some kind of systematized, some kind of network, some kind of space that people can go to and have that. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's 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 crucial. Um, you know, when I because I I admit at times I try to I try to imagine I try to think. Okay, so what does justice look like? Like ideally, you know, okay, uh, tra- you know a transgression has occurred, like someone has been abused by someone else. It's horrible. It's, it's traumatic. It's tragic. Like what is our vision then for like what justice looks like? 
There you know, are activist yeah. communities that do this kind of work and do this visioning work, and and there is a practice called restorative and transformative justice, right? Um, which I'm sure you've heard of, but for folks who haven't, it is a process that is very um, community based. It is in direct contrast to the prison industrial complex, right? It's in direct contrast to. Um, you have harmed someone and you get thrown into this horrible situation in which you then are harmed um, by the horrific prison system that we have in this country. Um, and then you, n- no healing happens, no transformation happens, nothing is resolved. And so I say restorative and transformative because the idea is that you don't want to restore to where we were. You want to transform to somewhere else. And so it brings together the community and both the person who has harmed and the person who has done harm kind of have to be involved in that process. And it's a mediated, moderated process with community members and friends and what have you. And for this kind of trauma and this kind of harm, it can take a really long time, a really, really long time. And I would love to see um, more integration of that kind of work, but it's also like it's it is a deep commitment, right? It is a deep commitment on the part of everyone, and like the people who have been harmed, sure as shit, don't have to agree to that. Of course, you, you know, like if they're like no fucking way, like yeah, of course not, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think that there's there's that kind of thing in terms of like a larger a larger issue around how do we actually like heal our society. Not everyone that abuses comes from this, but there are pe- there is definitely a cycle of abuse. Like people who are abused when they were younger or in different situations then abuse when they get older, right? Like mm-hmm. how do we break that cycle um, and create like healthy ways of coping, <laughs> right? Um, but the other thing is like, what do we do for our industry now? And uh, this is, I can't talk about the things that I'm doing. <laughs> Right, right. Um, There's one thing I, so basically what I did just, you know, I'm happy to say this much is that like I immediately started mobilizing and having conversations with people to figure out what kinds of interventions are needed and starting to build committees and groups and organizations and figure out who's doing what, who should be doing what and what those interventions look like. So I'm not quite ready to talk about them publicly yet and and, because we're getting them off the ground. Um, But one is, um, one, one thing that I, we are working on is a hotline. You know, it's a very basic support system of like, you call like a games and online harassment hotline where you can call in and you can get some support for what is going on. You can talk to someone who understands the industry, but isn't necessarily in the industry (laughs) Um, and, and get help around whether you're, you know, really activated emotionally and need someone to talk to, or whether you need resources to deal with online harassment or legal aid or what have you and, and, and help provide those networks because right now it's done privately, right? Like yeah. somebody who happens to know me can reach out and ask me to help somebody else. And you know, that's not tenable. I can't like, of course, of the, the, course. The, the, like the, like 10 of us <laughs> who have been in this for years and years and years, like we can't individually help everybody. Right. Um, so I think something like that could be really cool. So we're trying to get that off the ground. And um, if you're interested in that and want to help support it um, or help want to help financially contribute to getting that going, please um, reach out to us and let us know. We are working on ways for you to be able to do that. Some kind of positive change has to has to come out of uh, of a moment like this, right? We we have to be committed to addressing in whatever ways we can. Um, yeah, and they have to be yeah. like, you know, my my focus here is on short-term and long-term interventions, right? Like how do we help people today and then now that need it? And how do we create long-term systemic right. change where this eventually is a horrifying thing that we remember in the past mm-hmm. uh, and isn't a thing that progresses into the future? Um, so yeah, I um, forget what I was going to say. Cool. Good podcasting, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, oh, oh, I remember now. Um, I, I, for anyone who's listening who um, has been harmed, um, you know, like you're not alone in this. Uh, we still have Feminist Frequencies DMs open on Twitter. So if you want to reach out, please feel free to. Um, we're here. We can listen to your stories and, um, and be there for you. But also, regardless of that, on a bigger level, like you aren't alone in this. And please reach out to people in your life um, you will hopefully be surprised at how attentive and supportive folks can be. Uh, 
you know, yeah, I just, I, it makes me, it, it breaks my heart when I think about how lonely a uh, lot of it can be these survivors so, feel. I mean, yes, it, it can be tremendously isolating. I mean, you know, it can be compounded the, sh- you know, the, the, the shame of, even though of course somebody who, who uh, survives, who experiences something like this has nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, our culture uh, imbues the, the experience of course, with, with just tremendous shame. There's so many factors that play into reasons why people can feel just deeply, deeply isolated uh, in the wake of something like this, which is, uh, you know, tremendously difficult in and of itself. Yeah. We, so we believe you. Yeah. Yes. We (laughs) believe you. Yeah. We believe you. Um, all right. Well, that was depressing. I'm glad we had this conversation. Yeah. Um, I am too. And also, like, it, I say that, and it's no more depressing than, like, be- living in this day in and day out. And if we can um, help folks start having these conversations in their communities yeah. and not stop them, like, not stop talking about this and thinking about it, because I guarantee you this stuff is happening in your communities, in your workplaces. Um, and so let's figure out ways to support that. Um Please, again, also, if you are interested in learning more about some of the interventions that um, we are working on, uh, please let us know and we'll keep you posted. Um, Oh, you should sign up for Feminist Frequencies newsletter. That would be a great place (laughs) to to, uh, to, to let us know that you care about stuff and so we can share with you. So we'll put the Um, link to do that in the in the show notes, of course. Yeah, of course we will. We are so organized. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. All right. Well, I think that that's, I think yeah. that that's that. We will yeah. be back next week with a totally normal episode of <laughs> yeah. Feminist Frequency Radio, yeah. where we bullshit about some bullshit. Exactly. That's what that we do. That's our new name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where we bullshit about some bullshit. Oh, yeah. Um. Cool. Thanks for listening, we- everyone. Take care. Yeah. Bye.